Okay, so if any of you don't know me, my name's Miss Powers. Um, Mr. Gallo and I will be doing a little series on um, intersections between history and marine biology for this semester, so really excited about that. Today I thought we would look at some um, underwritten history or underrated history about um, a pirate <clears throat> from the 1600s, late 1600s, who actually made some very uh, major contributions to the field of marine biology and science specifically. Um, <clears throat> but he doesn't get credit in textbooks and, and we'll, we'll talk about what he did and why he might not receive the credit that um, some might argue he deserves. So this is William Dampier. Um, Okay, so he was a pirate. So if you don't know what a pirate is, um, pretty much thieves of the sea, right? Um, so during the 1600s, you would have uh, exploration was huge, right? Because the whole world hadn't been explored yet. So people really didn't know what was out there. Um, and they would hire explorers. And this was a career you could do. Um, so there are also pirates on the seas who were seizing these ships. Um, so they would take over a ship and just rob them. Um, maybe take, you know, take over the crew, the, I don't know, whatever they wanted to do. The, the goal of pirates is to find treasure ultimately, um, and to rob everyone they came into contact with. So, um, he, you know, he looks very well, well put together here, but don't let that fool you. He is... Um, a pirate, and he's actually the leader of his his pirate ship. Um, so he's also exploring, though, but he's not being he's not being paid by um, a king and queen to do that for a country like, say, Christopher Columbus was. Um, and Christopher Columbus was from um, Italy, but was traveling for Spain. Um, exploring for Spain. So this was a big industry at the time. And um, anyways, so in between pillaging and plundering, William Dampier spent every spare moment exploring the natural environment and meticulously documenting everything in sight. So not only is he <laughs> robbing ships and um, taking, trying to find buried treasure and things like that, He's also journaling um, his observations of the new world, things people haven't observed yet. Um, for example, he, his um, observations of the hummingbird were used by many early scientists. Um, he describes it as a pretty little feathered creature, no bigger than a great overgrown wasp. Um, he also observed the armadillo. Some, for some of the first observations of that animal, which is, uh, <clears throat> I believe an armadillo is also called an anteater. Don't quote me on that. You can ask Mr. Gallo about that. Um, but he wrote, the head is small with a nose like a pig on any danger. She lies stock still like a land turtle. <laughs> and though you toss her about, she will not move herself. <laughs> so he's not a very, you know, orthodox, um, explorer or observer, uh, sounds like he tossed the turtle around a little bit. Um, so anyways, his passion and detailed descriptions would one day inspire scientists, writers, and British, um, travelers alike, <clears throat> even though he's an outlaw. Oh, how do I change this slide? Oh, oops. Okay. Sorry. Skipped a few on me. Okay, so yeah, his picture of, I don't know, a painting of pirates taking over a ship. Um, so in between doing things like this, he was um, a scientist, essentially. Um, so no wonder he, he's not written in textbooks, right? People don't really want to um, give, give that honor to someone who did such uh, unacceptable things. <clears throat> is the point here, and you guys can discuss that if you if you'd like more in live lesson. Um, so let's see what else do I have here. 
1679, um, he signed up with a group of buccaneers who planned a trip to the South Seas. They ended up sailing all the way around the world. So he did a, he did a trip all the way around the world. One of the places they stopped was Australia. So this made him one of the first Englishmen to visit Australia. Um, and he wrote, so this is his observation of Australia. So it's not yet determined whether is it an whether it's an island or a main continent, but I am certain that it joins neither Asia, Africa, nor America. So this journey lasted more than twelve years. His trip around the world. This dude like lived on this on the ship exploring, right? Besides his observations of animals and plants. Um, Dampier kept careful records on winds, currents, and latitude and longitude. Um, and maybe you guys could have a discussion about what those things are. <laughs> I don't know. Depends on what Mr. Gallo wants. Okay, so he stored all his notes in bamboo tubes sealed with wax. When he returned to Europe, he wrote his first book that was titled A, Voyage, a New Voyage Round the World. So this actually became a bestseller, his book about the 12-year journey around the world. Um, let me see what my next slide looks like. Nope. Not there yet. Still, still looking at the pirates. Okay. So after the success of his first voyage, uh, he became captain of his ship and was invited to lead the first scientific expedition to Australia. So the first official like, scientific expedition to Australia, I guess. But at the time, it was called New Holland. It wasn't called Australia. Um, so, anyways, Dampier was fascinated by all the new animals and plants that he encountered in Australia. Can you imagine seeing ca a kangaroo for the first time? Um, while the ship's artist made... So they actually had an artist on the ship who made drawings. Uh... Sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> um, he carefully collected and preserved plant specimens to accompany his notes. So he's actually collecting things and bringing them back to observe, too, which... Science, right? <laughs> That's science. Um, so... I'm clearly not a science teacher. So unfortunately... Oh, no. Okay, so here's the thing. On this trip, his rickety ship sank on the way home resulting in a court-martial and fine, but he didn't die and his career didn't end. This guy's insane. Um, he wrote a second book called A Voyage to New Holland about his trip to Australia this time. Um, and then in 1703, he returned to the sea, circling the globe as a privateer and capturing prizes. So again, he returned as a pirate after that nice little official trip. He it didn't, yeah, anyways. He returned to being a pirate. Um, so his final journey. Um, so he actually was a successful pirate. You don't usually hear about that in history, too. It's usually like they, their ship sank or, you know, you don't have like um, a long career because it's pretty dangerous, right? So anyways, his third and last voyage around the globe in 1708... Um, he was also, you know, doing science on this trip. He um, rescued another pirate, pirate who was stranded um, off an island on the coast of Chile. And it was on this trip that he actually seized a Spanish treasure ship. So like this picture, he actually found and took over, successfully robbed, a Spanish treasure ship. <laughs> um, and he's an Englishman. He's from England. So, um, it's on this trip. His share of the booty, right? Pirate's booty. Jewels, silver plate, musk, cinnamon, cloves, silks, damasks, and taffetas. I don't know what that is. Taffetas, maybe? And Chinese porcelain provided him with a considerable fortune. So at this time, too, you guys got to think, like, this is how things are being shipped from country to country to be sold. So the pirates are trying to intersect that, um like, treasure, right, before it's sold so that they get it. So he did that successfully, was able to retire as a pirate, 
right? This is like his retirement fund. He's like, cool, I'm done. I did what I needed to do. Um, so he dies a few years later at the age of 63, uh, but, but not, you know, but of natural causes. People didn't live that long at this time. That was actually a long lifespan in the six, late 1600s, early 1700s, because you got to think like there, there weren't any vaccines that we have today. There weren't, there wasn't modern medicine. Um, people just weren't aware of certain things, uh, because of the, the advancements at the time. So anyways, dies at 63 in natural causes. Um, okay, so famous people he influenced. So um, Charles Darwin on the right, <clears throat> who I'm sure you guys will talk about, who uh, wrote the theory of natural selection. His um, theories on evolution were extremely paramount and uh, monumental and history, science, um, all fields, really. So, in England, his best-selling books about his voyages, um, William Dampier, the pirate, they generated <clears throat> this new enthusiasm for travel writing, too. So people really, like his books were, uh, were best-sellers in England. So people started really, um, there, there started, like, this market of books about exploring the new world because people wanted to read about it at home essentially right so his book actually inspired um gulliver's travels too i don't know if, if you guys have heard about this um i think as a kid i read it so it's about so it's a it's a comedy at the time um pretty much making fun of uh books about explorers and like adventure on the high seas so it's it's this you know mythological story about uh gulliver who travels to all these different islands and on one island he finds all these really small people which you can see here so it's a really funny book um and i think they have a movie based on it too you could watch so his discoveries and his his real book on exploring inspired this comedy. Um, he inspired Charles Darwin um, because he had visited the Galapagos. So almost 150 years after Dampier visited, Charles Darwin goes and um, brought his book with him. When making those discoveries on evolution, he actually had the book that Dampier had written about his observations. Um... And James Cook on the left is an English explorer who used Dampier's maps of winds and currents on his journeys. Um, you guys have probably never seen a map on wind or current, but at the time you have to think none of these ships had engines, so those were extremely valuable to the field of exploring and science. Um, so big contributions. So by the end of his life... Oh, this is another picture of Gulliver's Travels where he goes to an island where there's some kind of... I can't remember what the deal with this is, of course, but... Oh, okay. I'm going to go back to a different picture. Okay, there he is. So by the end of his life, he was recognized um, as an explorer and a naturalist, but he was never able to shake free of his association with pirates. <laughs> Um, perhaps that is why so many people have never heard this remarkable story of the pirate who collected plants. All right. And that's about it. Maybe you guys could have a discussion amongst yourselves about why was his work important and why isn't it written about in textbooks? Should it be or should it not be? Should his reputation as a pirate, um overwrite his contributions as a scientist?